Uh, good evening. It's good to see everybody here this evening. I want to take just a moment and thank all those that have going to help with the service this night. Uh, start with Linda Burnett on the piano, and what a blessing it is to be able to come and sit and listen for a while. Patriarch Pete Tantler will give us our invocation. High Priest Robert Ostrander will give us our benediction. My name is Robert Beeman, the elder. We are privileged tonight to have uh, Tyler Krutner, one of our priests, given our message this night. And what a joy it's been to watch his family, Emily, James, and Elodie, as they uh, grow in our congregation. So I thank you. Let us be called to worship. I'm going to read from Moroni 7, 33 through 35. And by so doing, the Lord God prepareth the way that the residue of men may have faith in Christ, that the Holy Ghost may have place in his heart, according to the power thereof. And after this matter bringeth to pass the Father the covenant which he hath made unto the children of men. And Christ has said, If he have faith in me, he shall have power to do whatsoever thing is expedient in me. If you would turn your hymnals to hymn number 22. I'm sorry, it's 222, I'm sorry. Our loving Heavenly Father, each one of us this night has gathered here in this place made 
made holy by your presence. Each one has desired to find themselves in the company of the faithful saints. Each one has chosen this over all other choices to be near you, to listen to the words of life that shall be given to us this night, to bask in the sweet fellowship and the sweet peacefulness of the music that is provided for us, to offer up our lives to the singing of our hymns, to pray silently for one another. All of these things, Heavenly Father, we feel a privilege and are blessed by your presence. We invite thy presence to continue to be with us, and especially with our young brother, Tyler. He has uh, chosen to seek you in his life, to find uh, direction in his life, how he might uh, serve you in love and devotion. And by serving you in love and devotion to lead the saints and the faithful fellowship to draw closer to you. I pray, Heavenly Father, special blessing on him as he leads us to you, that your spirit might guide us and that your spirit might come into the, our lives, each one of us, as he, uh, as he chooses those words, as he chooses uh, what he has studied. May your spirit enlighten his mind. May the spirit magnify his words that we might uh, understand more completely your will for us, that each one of us might grow in the likeness of your son. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading for this evening comes from Doctrine and Covenants, section 4. Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. Therefore, O ye that embark in the service of God, see that ye serve him with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, that ye may stand <clears throat> blameless before God at, God at the last day. Therefore, if ye have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. For behold, the field is white, already to harvest, and lo, he that thrusteth in his sickle with his might, the same layeth up in store that he perish not, but bring salvation to his soul. And faith, hope, charity, and love, with an eye single to the glory of God, qualifies for him for the work. Remember, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence, Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you.
good evening. It's, it's wonderful to be here with you tonight. I am always in awe of this position here, and I pray that you will uh, go with me on, on a, a short, short journey here. Um, <clears throat> as many of you are aware, I, I am an, I'm, a, I'm a nurse. I'm an ER nurse, and I have been for 11 years now. I love my job. I love many aspects of my job. I've had the opportunity to see many wonderful things. I've had the opportunity to be that familiar face for some of you that have come into my ER. I've been that one person to uh, get an IV in a small baby that needed that life-saving meds. I've been that, that person to shock somebody back to life, to see that once motionless, colorless face start to breathe again. Now, don't get me wrong. I've always said to myself, God is the one who can give and take away lives. But I like to think that myself and my team give that person their opportunity. So with all the good I've seen, I've unfortunately seen the bad. I've seen the sad. I've seen the terrible side of people. I've dwelt with angry, drunk people. I've had to explain why someone needs to wait just a little bit longer in the waiting room for those long periods of time while we have to rush somebody back immediately. I've had to watch small children pass for some reason that they're called home to God. And I've had to see parents come hoping to the air, hoping to see their 16-year-old kid that was in a car accident. So I want to talk about something tonight, something that's been bothering me for a while. It's something that's very studied and very talked about, especially in my line of work. It's called compassion fatigue. Many of you may be familiar with it. Um, it's not an idea that's isolated to the ER. Many other professions have this. Um, it's defined as fatigue, emotional distress, or apathy, resulting from the constant demands of caring for others. Teachers, caretakers, first responders, they're all subject to this. So now let me put it this way. Are we as individuals suffering compassion fatigue for Christ? Being a Christian is demanding. It's constant. It's in a way we have, it's in the way that we have chosen to live our lives. We have chosen to be that light for Christ. Have we been fulfilling that calling? We live a busy life. Are we witnessing to those in need? <clears throat> so what can we do? What hope do we have? Are we suffering compassion fatigue for Christ? I found a webpage that has specific causes and, um, of the compassion fatigue in the missionary field. Here are four things that we can do to think about for ourselves. First, analyze your intentions and your motivations. And it uses James chapter 2, starting in 14, as a reference for that. What profit is it, my brethren, for a man to say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? Yea, a man may say, I will show thee I have faith without works. But I say, show me thy faith without works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. For if a brother or sister be naked and destitute, and one of you say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding... He gave not those things which are needful to the body. What profit is your faith unto such? Even so faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. Therefore wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead and cannot save you? Are we truly a servant for God? Honesty with ourselves is a key. Am I working for the glory of, of Jesus or for myself? Am I showing compassion out of love for others? 
Am I serving for the sake of my own consequences before God? We must analyze our intentions and motivations in order to, uh, to find the reasons behind our fatigue. Working solely for one's reputation with others or solely for one's moral checklist before God can indeed be truly exhausting. Their second point, rest productively. This one I have uh, had trouble understanding. They show Psalms, chapter 127. Except the Lord build a house, thy labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and sit up late, to eateth the bread of the sorrows, for so he giveth beloved, his beloved sleep. There seems to be always something to do. I feel like I always have a list of things that, that needs to be done either on the house or at work. But God gives us time to recharge. He wants the Sabbath day for us to spend away from the world to be able to reconnect with him. Number three, remind yourself who Jesus is and who you are. Isaiah chapter 40. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching for his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall, find, shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Always remember, God is the creator of all. <clears throat> endless worlds has he created, endless lives has he created, and he is all-powerful. We must know our place in this world and know that God is in control. When we start to show our fatigue, we must fix our eyes upon Jesus. The last is, don't give up and don't give in. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. We have Christians have a promise that as we serve God, we will have everlasting life. We have the restored gospel. Know that celestial life is for those worthy of being called by his name. We must never give up, never give in, and look to him for our peace. With that warning of complacency in our Christian lives, how do we move past this? According to the theme helps, the topic for this morning and this evening I combined into one to form the statement, the time is even more urgent, be the means of doing much good. I don't think that I need to state the urgency of the hour. We have been warned about this time. We have seen the gathering storm. We have been called to, our, to, called to have our houses in order. <clears throat> we are also called to be the means of doing much good. Who is called to be the means of doing much good? Doctrine and Covenants 119. <laughs> 8b. All are called according to the gifts of God unto them, and to the intent that they may, be, may labor together. Let him that laboreth in the ministry, and him that toileth in the affairs of men, of businesses, and of work, labor together with God for the accomplishment for the work entrusted to all. <clears throat> God is a loving God, and he has given many gifts. In Galatians 5, it states that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. How we choose to use these gifts and the opportunity uh, to bring many unto the knowledge of Jesus. Are we witnessing for those around us? Are we caring for the needy? Are we caring for the widowed? 
my wife and I know a very nice lady. She was our former neighbor. We lived next to her for a couple years and always had a friendly relationship with her. Uh, about two weeks after we moved away from our house, um, the neighbor called my wife early one morning and she was frantic. She was distraught and all that she and my wife could make out was that her husband died. Now, my wife being the caring person that she is, she dropped everything. She called into work and she spent the day to help this lady. For more of the backstory, this woman has only lived in the United States for a couple years. She relied on her husband to do most everything. Her understanding of the English language is a struggle at times. But my wife was doing what we are called to do. We wish that we could do more and spend more time with her, but we are attempting and still trying to help as we can. What we are supposed to do as Christians, are we being the means to doing much good? We must be a people to have the desire to listen to our Heavenly Father. We are called in Latter-day Revelation to become a peculiar people. We must, be, we must not be concerned with doing what is popular, what is the ever-changing views on being politically correct. We must be good uh, despite the possibility of persecution. Jesus set the example. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ministered to his children, all while suffering and paying the ultimate price. So what are we allowing in? What are we allowing to reside in our lives? I found a short story to help us learn how easy this compassion fatigue or empathy, apathy, sets in. So let's not allow the enemy to distract us. Satan called a worldwide convention. In his opening address to his evil angels, he said, we can't keep Christians from going to church. We can't keep them from reading their Bibles and knowing the truth. We can't even keep them from conservative values. But we can do something else. We can keep them from forming an intimate, abiding relationship and experience in Christ. If they gain that connection with Jesus, our power over them is broken. So let them go to church. Let them have their conservative lifestyles, but steal their time so they can't gain that experience in Jesus Christ. This is what I want you to do, angels. <clears throat> Distract them from gaining hold of their Savior and maintaining that vital connection throughout their day. How shall we do this, the angels said. Keep them busy in the non-essential of life and, the, and invent unnumbered schemes to occupy their minds, he answered. <clears throat> Tempt them to spin, 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 borrow, borrow, borrow. Convince the wives to work long hours and the husbands to work six or seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day, so they can afford their lifestyles. Keep them from spending time with their children as their family fragments soon their home will offer no escape from the pressures of work. Overstimulate their minds so they cannot, so they cannot hear that still small voice. Entice them to play the radio or a cassette whenever they are to drive. To keep the TV, CDs, DVRs, and PCs going constantly in their homes and see that every store and restaurant in the world plays non-biblical music constantly that will jam their minds and break their union with Christ. Fill their coffee tables with magazines, newspapers, pound their minds with news 24 hours a day, invade their driving moments with billboards, flood their mailboxes with junk mail, catalogs, and every kind of newsletter and promotional offering, free product services, and false hopes. Even in their recreation, let them be excessive. Have them return their recreation exhausted um, and unprepared for the coming week. Don't let them go out in nature and reflect on God's wonders. Send them to amusement parks, sporting events, concerts, and movies instead. And when they meet their spiritual fellowships, involve them in gossip and small talk so that they leave with troubled consciences and unsettled emotions. Let them be involved in soul winning, but crowd their lives with so many causes they have no time to seek power from Christ. Soon they will be working in their own strength, sacrificing their health and family unity for the cause of the good. 
It was quite a convention in the end. And the angels went eagerly to their assignments, causing Christians everywhere to get busy, 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 and rush here and there. Has the devil been successful in his schemes? Brothers and sisters, God has given us a beautiful promise. In Genesis chapter 9. And it came to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant which I have made between me and which I have made between uh, the, all the living creatures of all the flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy the flesh, and the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant which I made unto thy father Enoch, that when men shall keep all my commandments, Zion should again come to the earth, the city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself. And this is mine everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. He has a plan, and he wants our full attention. He wants us to show devotion to him and to bring about much good to this place. We have been called to a marvelous work. It is up, up to us to decide how we would respond. I would like to share the parable of the sower. I'm sure many of you know and are familiar with that. I feel it is fitting for this subject. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and, uh, and forthwith they sprung up. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, because they had no deepness of earth, and because they had no root, and they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, but others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let them hear. Now hear, the par hear therefore of the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart, this is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and readily with joy, with joy received it, yet hath no root in himself and endureth but for a while. For when tribulation and persecution, persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also who received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of the riches choke the word and becometh unfruitful. But he that receiveth seed unto, their, unto the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth and endureth, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some of an hundred and some sixty and some thirty. Which one are you? Which one am I? Which one can we be? And how will we respond? In Doctrine and Covenants 10, Behold, the field is white and all ready to harvest. Therefore, whoso desireth to reap, let him thrust in his sickle with his might and reap the, as the day last, that he may treasure up for his soul everlasting salvation in the kingdom of God. Yea, whosoever will thrust in his sickle and reap, the same is called of God. Therefore, if you will ask of me, ye shall receive. If you will knock, it shall be opened unto you. Now, as you have asked, behold, I say unto you, Keep my commandments and seek to bring forth the establishment of the cause of Zion. Seek not for riches, but for wisdom, and behold, the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you. 
and then shall be you be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. In closing, the time is even more urgent. Be the means of doing much good. And if you're like me, compassion fatigue, more than anything else, should be a warning flag to all of us. It is an indicator of either, one, our motivations are skewed. Two, we just need proper rest. Three, we've forgotten our identity and God's identity. And four, we are starting to give up. Praise God that we are not alone in our works and that our feelings are not invalid. God can and will meet us in our weariness and energize us to keep going. I pray that this message um, will be a source of encouragement to you the next time you are thinking of me, you are overwhelmed and can't continue the work. Thank you for your time. eternal heavenly father in the name of your son jesus christ we bow before you to thank you for the opportunity to gather together this night and sit in worship of you and we thank you O oh father for that instruction that we have received and we thank you for the challenge that has been placed before us and pray that we might be up to that challenge that we might always do the things that are pleasing unto you and that will hasten your kingdom in these last days. So be with us, O Father. Forgive us of our sins and help us to glorify your holy name in the days to come. 
that we might bring honor and glory to your holy name is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.